Hello, and welcome to another episode of the Christian Reef podcast. Today's guest is the host of Curly Sue's Global Kitchen, which is a, a cooking show for veganists and vegan chefs alike. And this person has many different <laughs> titles. So she's a vegan cook, she's an author, uh, a vegan expert, speaker, and presenter, and of course, the presenter of those TV shows. So very welcome to the show, Curly Sue. How's it going? Fine, thank you. Thank you for having me. How are you? Very good, very good. This this was um, an exciting um, uh, one for me because obviously you reached out to me and uh, I wasn't familiar with your work, but I was obviously quite intrigued at the idea that, you know, not only are you a vegan chef and, and in, into that kind of lifestyle, which is something that, you know, I have friends that are vegan and stuff and I know a little bit about it, but not like enough to really like, you know, yeah talk at length in terms of like expertise or something um but it was really cool to see you know like um when I was doing my research on you you know all of your um different ventures that you've sort of done as a part of this and also you know the the tv shows as well which is uh, according to my research you, you know you've been doing it quite a long time as well um I think yes. your first one you actually started in about 2002 if, if I'm not mistaken and then it's been from that point onwards, more recently, you've had uh, a show in, in uh, 2017, and uh, we'll, we'll get we'll get to that. But um, I guess I, I, what I wanted to start with with this was, uh, what kind of age did you sort of become vegan? Was this a thing that happened when you were very young, or was this more in adult life? Or no, I became a vegan. Next month will be eight years ago. Okay. Prior to being a vegan, I was a vegetarian from the age of 18. Right, right, right. So I was a vegetarian for 20 something years and then I became a vegan. And, and a lot of vegans were vegetarians before. There's a small number, a lower number who go from meat eating straight to vegan. <sighs> Yeah, I, I get that. And it's, it's very plausible. I mean, I've thought about it myself. And, you know, I, th I think in the future, it definitely is something I will do. But it does seem extreme to go from me eating straight to vegan. I feel like it's a good kind of, I don't know, maybe like midway point before you go. <laughs> Some people do it. Some people do it. Yeah. I suppose it is, as well, another important thing that people don't always talk about as well is the... Um, actually how it affects your health like you know if you're going through a very drastic change like that obviously everyone reacts differently some people can make that transition and there's no problem at all and it's just a, a different way of life other people you know it's not that straightforward and you know maybe you need more uh, I don't know let's say like protein than the other per like the average person or something like that you know people have things like um uh, deficiencies in certain things in their body which you know you can make up with supplements and, and and so and so on but obviously the diet and and figuring that out is is quite a tricky thing and i guess what i wanted to ask you with that is was it difficult to kind of go through that process i mean i feel like if you're going from being a meat eater to a vegetarian you know it's not too difficult you know you go to your standard supermarket or whatever and um there's plenty of vegetarian options and um you know, like if you go to, even if you go to your know, restaurants and stuff or takeaways, you know, you've got lots and lots of different vegetarian options, but this, this vegan thing is, is quite, I don't want to say new cause that's not quite right. But in terms of like, uh, let's say like mainstream appeal and, uh, accessibility, that's the word I'm looking for. Um, it's yes. not maybe as accessible. So what, yeah, was it, was it difficult for you? Like, what was that process like? Um, transitioning to being a vegan or so because I was a vegetarian before and I was a dairy avoider before it wasn't a big transition but what I would say about making the transition is if you're becoming a vegan now it's much easier than it was years ago because now it's almost trendy. There's so much more information. There's a lot of celebrities who are vegan and have spoken about it publicly. There's, you know, vegan versions of almost everything. So mm. it's a lot easier now than it was before. But for me, it's not just about becoming vegan. It's a whole food plant-based diet because the misconception is, is if the 
food is vegan, that automatically makes it healthy. So if you have chips or fries, as Americans say, in deep, deep fried in oil, that's vegan, but there's nothing healthy about it. <laughs> yeah. so, so it has to be whole food, plant based. So that's a different approach to just being vegan because there, believe me, there's a ton of vegan junk food. I mean, you could eat, you know, a hundred percent nonsense and it's all vegan. So it's, it's about choosing a healthy diet, I would say. So that transition, again, to be honest, if you are healthy and you're focused on fresh fruits and vegetables and not eating too much processed junk, it's much easier and I think making the transition it's about doing it for me when people I mean it's a question I get asked all the time I want to make the transition how do I do it I always say start slowly don't just say right as from today (laughs) I'm never gonna have meat fish eggs a day ever again and I'm now going to be a vegan I think good luck it's not the body it's too much of a shock to the body i think so always say start slowly so pick a meal so say breakfast and for the next one or two weeks start having vegan breakfasts and then keep a a a list and a a, of all the recipes that you like so get a folder and as you find a vegan breakfast that you like keep the recipe then you can move on to snacks find different vegan snacks again keep a list the reason why i say keep the list is you're going to forget and think all right what did i have again but when you write it all down and you look at it you think ah actually yeah this is good so you're kind of creating your own little recipe bank and then you phase it in with all the other dishes until eventually you've got it down to a science basically i think in general as well that that sort of technique with anything in life is 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 quite good because it keeps you organized and and especially if you're trying to do something like that which is so big in your life such a big change in your life you need something to track that and to motivate you and you know i just feel like if you you don't have that it's a bit like you know you have like um i suppose it's kind of it's kind of like a bit weird but like it's it's a bit like giving up smoking like i gave up earlier this year and um, well done (laughs) thank you and the the, literally the only thing that kind of really kept pushing me and motivating me about that was the fact that I did a video about it and I kind of felt like oh I can't I can't go back on that now I've, I've said that I, you know what I mean it, it was like now it's set in stone and it's a marking point because obviously that was possibly in April time maybe a bit earlier than that um, but yeah point is there's something to kind of um, track that that progress and stuff and as you said you know you take steps here and there to change things and then get to your goal i suppose i suppose that's kind of the point isn't it it's like you've got the little goals yeah. and then you're a big overall goal of, of going full on but um yeah. yeah you mentioned um while you were describing your transition from vegetarian to uh, vegan that you became a vegetarian at age 18 which i found quite interesting because yeah. i kind of naturally assumed that you were just a vegetarian from a young age uh, like a, as a younger no. age um, I just wanted to ask you about that. Was that like a a choice thing in the sense that like, um, like was your family quite strict on that growing up or was it just like you just decided, you know, <laughs> I've had enough, now I'm going to change and, and go for vegetarian? Okay, so I do not have anyone else. Well, when I became a, a vegetarian when I was 18, no one else in my family at the time was right. vegetarian. However... My background is I'm a Seventh-day Adventist, which is a Christian religion. I grew up in the church and the Seventh-day Adventist religion upholds vegan vegetarianism and healthy eating, healthy mind, healthy body, healthy spirit. So I've always been familiar. So when in our churches, they have usually like a potluck meal where everybody brings it. It's usually vegetarian the meal so they 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 don't say you have to be but it's encouraged so that's where I kind of got the first kind of um, information about you know possibly changing to this kind of diet so then um, we my mum had a friend who was a vegan that we knew when I was small but he was I think he did he was raw food which going back then he was ahead of his time because back then no one 
there wasn't it wasn't popular it wasn't something people even knew the name of it's mm. just when i thought about it as an adult thinking of what he ate i thought oh he was raw he he mainly ate raw food and as a child i just thought this man is weird i thought <laughs> i hope we never get invited to his house for dinner because he can't cook basically <laughs> not realizing he was really healthy because i think he was like an older gentleman and he looked really good for his age he was really healthy really fit um, his skin looked wonderful, so but I didn't, I wasn't familiar with how it all worked then. But now, um, when I first became a vegetarian, my parents were kind of like, oh, okay. My dad was more encouraging. He was like, no, I think that's a good idea. Mm. And as time went on, um, my mom started to buy vegan cookbooks. She bought one oh, cool. um, cookbook if there's one vegan in the family. So she used to try recipes from it. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. It's like, how'd you cook one meal just for the vegetarian at the time? But nowadays, my family, I realize I'm really blessed because when I go to family um, gatherings, they always, always cater for me as a vegan. They're mm. really good. For example, when we had um, a family gathering, they usually make a sticky toffee pudding and they make it vegan. Cool. So my sister who makes it is not vegan, but she learned using recipes from Nigella, Paul Hollywood and all of that. And Mary Berry put it all together, did her own twist on it and then did a vegan version of it. And quite honestly, she's been kind of getting her friends who are not vegan to try it out. And they're saying to her, is, is this really vegan? I mean, it just doesn't <laughs> taste vegan. I just thought, okay, fair enough. So I'm, re I'm really blessed in that way that they're really supportive. I do have, um vegans that i have met who said that their family are the complete opposite they're very anti-vegan they say awkward and they don't they're not supportive at all so i realized that that for me is a really brilliant advantage so i'm really really pleased about that i'm interested about that um because obviously if we were talking say 30 40 years ago i would understand that kind of backlash because you know the, i suppose you know for for many people just being vegetarian was was tricky you know it was like oh it's people being maybe fussy or people being diff that difficult on purpose or something or mm -hmm. or whatever the case may be yeah. yeah there was obviously like moral implications and stuff and i th i feel like you know because obviously i grew up in in the 90s and then you know over the years i've i've seen that too um how people's attitudes have changed and stuff. And obviously like healthy eating and lifestyles are really, really important now, but I'm intrigued that you still kind of get pushback to this day. Like what, what kind of pushback do you get? You don't have to go into like two specifics, but what, what kind of reasons are people pushing against that? Well, I would have thought that it would be embraced by all, but at this point, <laughs> no, I wish there's still a bit of a stigma that if it's, something is vegan then it's tasteless or it's not filling um there's still people who think that and then there's still people who don't really know what a vegan is so okay. when people say to me what is a vegan i say no meat no fish no eggs no dairy no honey and they go honey so well yeah honey's come from bees bees are I said, nothing with a face or parents. And they're like, ah, because I've been to um, functions where I said, oh, I ordered the vegan dish. Oh, yeah, no problem. The fish is coming out soon. I think, okay, how does that work? They just <laughs> don't get it. I went to a particular event once. I know, it's crazy. I went to a particular event once and you could book in advance to say I'm a vegan. Right. So right, I right. knew the person organizing the event and she said, I, when I got there, she said, Suzanne, I really need your help. I said, oh, what's happened? She said, there's, um, I think, six people who've said that they're vegan who are coming to this event. She says, I don't think the hotel have really catered for them. She said, can you just go in the kitchen and help them? So I went into the kitchen, spoke to the chef, cheeky. and he was like, yeah, sure. Well, right. he knew I was the, with the organizer and he was really glad. Uh, he went, I don't know what to make. I said, I don't know. What, <laughs> I mean, you have to because, you know, we're paying the hotel money. So, yeah, you're going to have to be a bit bolshy and go in there and go, right, what's going on? Yeah. And yeah. he was like, I'll be really honest. I'll be really honest. I don't, I, I don't really know what to make. I went, okay, we've got less than an hour before the event starts. 
um, can I talk you through a recipe? Yeah, you went, yeah, yeah. I said, have you got any chickpeas? He said, yeah, sure. I said, okay, get those. I said, have you got any curry powder? He said, yes. I said, okay. I said, have you got any onions, peppers, garlic? I said, right, do it. I said, right, make a chickpea curry. I'm going to talk you through. I said, do this, do that. And he went, oh, okay, all right. And then he made it. And I just thought, you're in a hill to, maybe I shouldn't say the name of the hotel, but a particular hotel, higher hotel. And obviously they booked you because you know what you can do. But you really told me you couldn't even Google a recipe, a vegan recipe and just follow it. So to me, I'm just like, it's almost like they feel paralyzed. Oh, it's vegan. I didn't learn that at chef school. What do I do now? I think, okay, it's obviously a mindset because quite frankly, there's lots of things that they can make which don't require you to have the skill of Gordon Ramsay in the slightest. So yeah, there's, there's still um, a stigma and a mindset that people think, oh, it's vegan. Oh no, no, it's going to be rubbish or it's going to be not going to taste nice. Although say, there are some vegans who can't cook, I must admit. <laughs> I've got to say that that does kind of surprise me. I mean, okay, I've, I've not tried like all vegan dishes, but the stuff that I have tried, I've always really enjoyed. I mean, particularly vegan cakes. Oh my God. Just oh, okay. the best stuff I've tried as vegan <laughs> cakes. But I, I think it's just, it's a lot, a lot of it sounds like a kind of combination of misinformation on people's part, or mm-hmm. maybe not misinformation, but like, um, misunderstanding i mean your point about like you know (laughs) being served fish when it's you've said that you're vegan i've seen this kind of mistake so many times at so many different events i've been at and there's always that kind of blank face of yeah it's vegan what's the problem and you're like well it you know it's not supposed to have this and this and this and they're like oh okay this is awkward (laughs) but it's that sort of thing if you do the research it's it's not too tricky it's you know a lot a lot of these things as you said like chickpeas you can get that in any standard supermarket it's really 45 pence for a tin or less yeah yeah i I get some of this stuff as well um because you know it's it's super cheap and it's um it's healthy obviously and it's it's different as well It's, it's it's better than just having like your standard like i don't know rice dish or whatever like you can just mix it up and try different things i I really like um like lentils and 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 stuff like that as well i think that's you know you can you can be kind of experimental with that and it gives it like a different not just a different taste but different texture as well and and so on but um anyway (laughs) um obviously you've told us how how you sort of got into becoming a vegetarian and vegan but when did you sort of first start like trialing with, with cooking i understand that you grew up with a family that were you know like very into their cooking and stuff but like when did you first start doing vegan cooking well uh, i when i first became a vegetarian the it wasn't as popular as it is now so okay. what i used to do is keep trying out different recipes because i was born and raised in london Um, My parents are from Jamaica. They were born and raised in Jamaica. Well, yeah, born in Jamaica and and came to England in their teens. Um, So obviously I grew up with eating English food at school and eating Caribbean food at home. (laughs) I feel you. I feel you. (laughs) Sorry. (laughs) Yeah. So I, obviously if you're, you have a Jamaican if you have Jamaican parents, you will be very familiar and that's kind of your palate. That's kind of the, the, the benchmark for stuff. So I found that a lot of the, the vegetarian recipes weren't quite my, to my taste. So what I used to do is tweak them and then keep a copy of the recipe in a file. And then it got to a point where I thought this could be a book. So Uh, I decided to write a cookbook. My very first cookbook was in 2012 called Curly's Kitchen. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I'm a, we'll, 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 we'll get to that in a little bit. But um, yeah. I, I think it, it's quite an exciting thing when you, when you have that. Like I've had that with, it's a bit different, with, but with my creative endeavours, when you get that like light bulb moment and you're like, ooh, this, this could be something. <laughs> it's an yeah. exciting thing. Yes. Yeah. But yeah. yeah. Um, let's let's bring it back to just just veganism in general and and the health side of things. But what would you say are the major kind of health benefits of going vegan in comparison with other types of diets and lifestyles? 
there is the opportunity um, from a whole, whole food plant-based vegan diet to reduce the the amount of um, saturated fat that you ah, have yeah. in the food that you have also there's um more links to cancers for meat and fish right, um, yeah, yeah. eating than there is to um, being a vegan. But what kind of swung it for me is there's a book called, I don't know if you've heard of it, called The China Study by T. Colin Campbell. I'm not familiar with that one. Familiar with it? Okay. It was a study... It was called the China study. It was done. It's a basically a collection of different. Stu- the China study itself is a study that was done by lots of independent um, researchers who were doctors or scientists, but they didn't all know they were doing more or less the same study at, you know, roughly the same time. So what they were trying to find out is in rural parts of China, certain rural parts of China, why are they so healthy and they have practically zero cancers and heart disease and things Mm. like that. So they did a study. The reason they did it in rural China is because in those particular parts of rural China, they've had the same people there for hundreds of years because it's an area where you don't get anyone going in or out. So it's almost like a controlled environment to do a test, so to speak. So everyone there is born there, raised there, their great, great grandparents going back a hundred thousand years, whatever, are all from there. So they're the same group of people. So when they did the test, they did the test over a 20 year period. They all came to the conclusion it's because of what they eat. Mm. So the guy T Colin Campbell, he actually grew up on a dairy farm. So he was really interested and he realized that these people had little to no dairy whatsoever. So then this led him to become a vegan and it's in reading the book that I decided to become, to make the change from vegetarian to veganism. Yeah. So, that's, yeah, yeah. that's interesting as well, because I, I feel like you've, you've kind of got like a, a few different reasons why people ultimately go like vegetarian or vegan. And it can either be from like the moral perspective, which is perfectly understandable. I love animals. And <laughs> this is one of the reasons why I'm always toying with the idea and stuff. And like we mm-hmm. explained uh, or you explained earlier, um, it's not the sort of thing you can just do like that. You know, it's gradual. <laughs> um, yeah. But um but in terms of, of like um, lifestyle and stuff and, and the health benefits side of stuff, it is one of those things that you do. Not everyone kind of knows, you know, what the, the benefits actually are and, and like if it, will, if it will indeed be good for them. And it's, it's refreshing to kind of hear someone sort of say like, here's the facts, here's what I learned. And this is why I've kind of made that transition kind of thing. Because most people I know that went vegan, for the most part, yeah, it's the animals thing, which... yeah. It's fine. I'm not, I'm not, you know, saying that that's a bad thing at all. I'm just, you know, it's it's interesting to hear a different kind of reason (laughs) for that. But um, yeah, let's keep it moving forward. Um, So yeah, as as I mentioned in in the preamble, you are a TV presenter, also a YouTuber. Is there any kind of major differences in terms of like how you sort of approach presenting on those different mediums? Between YouTube and and where else and so like the obviously because you've okay as i understand it with the first show that you did you were i don't want to say like a panelist because that's not exactly right but like you're one of the the featured cooks on that show and then your more recent show you're like the host it's your thing it's your baby kind of thing you're you know managing the whole process Mm -hmm. um so i i would imagine that uh there's more of a closer link between that more recent show that you've done and then your YouTube as well. Cause obviously you're managing and all of the content on that. So in terms of like those two mediums, your know, TV versus YouTube, like what are the major differences between those two for you? And in, in terms of like how you create that content, how you produce it and just generally how you approach right. it. Right. The difference is when I think the shows you're talking about is the ones that were on 3ABN TV in America. Um, Those ones, obviously they're not produced by me. I flew to America to record those shows. I was supposed to go this year again, but obviously 
global pandemic had other ideas. <laughs> so it's different because they have more control over what happens. They, they're not um, too, they do give me some creative control because they say, you know, just let us know what recipes you're doing. Um, so you do have some say in how the program goes, but it's basically their production. So you kind of, you know, I know you're, you're an actor as well. So you understand how that works. If it's there is someone else's production, you have to, you know, go with the flow. So to what told, yeah. <laughs> yeah, 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 you know, use the discipline that you learn. Cause I went to a stage school. I went to the Sylvia Young Theatre School. So obviously right, yeah, you studied theatre at a young yeah. age. Didn't you? Yeah. yeah, yeah. So when you're doing your own thing, it's, it's completely different. It's, just, it's, it's a similar transferable skills because obviously speaking to camera, looking to the camera, engaging all of that, all of that work. But it's a different feeling and it's kind of more freeing mm. in one sense, but it can be a lot more pressure in another sense because the shows I did in America, at the end of the day, they're going to look at that channel and say, that's a program on that channel. Um, but if it's my production, it's all on you. So it's not going to be anything here. Yeah, so <laughs> so if there's a bad show, of... you can just be like, well, I wasn't on that one. <laughs> well, we don't want to foster a blame culture. But, yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> but it's, it's kind of like that. But if, you know, once you've um, tested the waters and you look at you've done your research and you know edited it and so forth my approach obviously to youtube is a bit more laid back um you basically a youtube channel you can put almost whatever you like on it mm. um with the stuff for the amazon series that was different because it was there was a lot more that went into that production half of it was filmed in jamaica and half of it was filmed here in london so it there was a lot more that went into it to produce those that series but it's i'm i'm quite proud of it i just think right if i die tomorrow okay at least i can say tick i've done that kind of thing so i'm i'm really proud of it and when it actually um went to broadcast during the pandemic it went out um began broadcasting in july mm -hmm. so then the vegan media picked up on it and I got a tr truckload of publicity on the back of it. So that obviously will push a lot of traffic to that and it opened up a few doors for me and so forth as well. So the, in terms of the approach with the Amazon one, you, um, those productions that I produced myself, you get to be more creative and you get to put in it what you want to put in it, which is, which is great. But you still have to think of the audience because it's not just for me to watch at home because <laughs> then I can really put only what I want but you still have to think what would the audience want to see mm. um, because I'm due to do series two which is kind of interesting during a pandemic how I'm supposed to do that but um, once I do series two there's things I've learned from series one that you know I would tweak as a presenter as well yeah so yeah, it's a different approach, but it's a similar skill set. But yeah, yeah, it's enjoyable. Yeah, that, that, that seems very logical to me. That's kind of the answer I expected as well. Um, so, yeah, since you brought it up, yeah, let's let's talk about it at length. So yeah, you have a cooking show with Amazon Prime. Uh, its full name is, as I mentioned before, Curly Sue's Global Kitchen. How did this come into fruition? Uh, talk to us a little bit about uh, this offer in in terms of like when it came how you know how it was delivered to you and such and um just, yeah just the, the process of, of putting this together because as you mentioned before this is very different to the shows you'd done in the past um this was your entirely your own thing and uh, when i was actually looking up at, at my research for this you know you were um i believe co-producer and the director for this as well so it was entirely your sort of production so tell us a little bit about that so I've always wanted to have my own cooking show and I must have knocked on however many doors, I don't know. And I mean, you know, in the show business, it's, it's a kind of partly a numbers game. So you have to keep knocking on doors, keep knocking on doors. And then I thought, 
there's got to be another way around this. So mm. I thought, okay, you know what? I'm just going to produce my own show. If they don't want to give me a show, then okay, that's your, your choice. I'm, I'm just going to produce my own. So I sat down and I thought, okay, what do I want it to be called? What do I want it to include? What could I do to make it different? Because I don't want it to just be me in the kitchen. And, and today we're going to make some jam. Uh, you just say, okay, everyone's done that, big deal. So I thought, what could I do to really up the level of production? So I thought, drone shots. So I thought, right, I want drone shots. And I thought, what about the backdrop? And I thought, okay, I could film some of it in Jamaica. So that would look amazing as well. And then and I thought if I, it wasn't just me, because I always, I th always think of, um, there's a quote by Michelle Obama. She said, when a door opens for you, hold the door open for somebody else. Mm. So always in whatever production I'm doing is hold the door open and bring in other people, um, actors, presenters and so forth to give them an opportunity to to have something else added to their CV and other experience and so forth. So I brought in some other people to be in the production. So it wasn't just, you know, three, you know, a series with just me, me, me and me. It's other people in it as well. So I sat down, um, wrote the, the shows and then I thought, right, I'm going to produce this. So my sister, Claudia, she helped me to produce it. So she's co-producer. Mm -hmm. And then I just thought, right, let's book some venues. Let's get some call sheets um, drawn up and let's, let's do this. So filming in Jamaica was an experience for me because I'd, I've been there tons of times, but I'd never filmed there. So I thought, let me do my research because all countries are different. And what I found out is when you're filming in Jamaica, because it is somewhere that people film a lot, there's rules around filming. So you have to get a license to film. You can't just film, turn up and just film whatever you like. Hmm. So there's a Jamaica film. There's a, it's called the uh, Film Jamaica. So you apply to them and they give you a license. You have to pay um, a fee, which is not a lot really. So you pay, you pay a fee, but you also have to make sure you employ somebody locally to be part of the production, which I totally understand because, you know, people, there want opportunities. So I did have, there's um, a lady in it who is actually my aunt's housekeeper who does the cooking. So she's showing me some dishes. So she was paid to be in that production as well. So I made sure she had, um, I involved some local people as well. And I went to a culinary school in Montego Bay, Jamaica and asked them to show me some dishes and their students got to be involved in the production as well. So I really made sure that it wasn't just pushing myself forward, but also giving other people some opportunities as well. And they were all paid for being in the show as well. So yeah, it, it, was, it was a really enjoyable experience. And then I filmed the rest of it here. So I hired a studio, boardroom studios in South London, which was really good, really great studio. A lot of really famous things are filmed there. And then it went into editing. And the idea was to see which channel was going to pick it up. Ah, okay. So... Okay, so this is that... interesting. So you, you, okay, so you've already filmed this whole thing, uh, funded it and uh -huh. produced it all yourself before it's even mm -hmm. commissioned for anything. You just knew you were going to do this and you were finding a platform yeah. to, wow, that's yeah. incredible. Yeah, yeah. I just thought, I'm, I'm just going to do this. So then I thought, okay, I'm going to see what platforms, um, channels will pick it up. So it's picked up by a channel in America. Um, oh, so it's, is... not, it's not just Amazon Prime then, it's also available. No. Yeah, it's on Sango TV, which is on Google Play. It's ah. also, it, it was on the Hope Channel in Africa. So it, that broadcast throughout the whole of the sub-Saharan Africa oh, wow. era, which is huge. That's yeah, huge um, reach. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, wow. massive. And then it was also on um, Loma Linda TV, ARTV, a few different, and then it's now on there. And it's just been picked up for an airline as well. 
flights. Um, I think it's South African Airlines as well. So we picked up. Wow. That well, congratulations. Well. That's awesome. <laughs> Thank um, you. J- just actually real quick, just hypothetical, just because I'm, I'm curious about that. If Amazon hadn't have uh, picked up, wh- where do you envision you would have put it out to? Like, what, would you have just kept looking for a particular uh external platform or would you have yeah produced mm-hmm. okay so you, you yeah. wouldn't have like just... i mean there's more I was, I was gonna say you wouldn't have just put it out like say for your own channel or something like that no because there's a bit of a i mean you could do but there is a bit of a stereotype that if you just put it on youtube and what because mm. If you produce a series and you put it on YouTube, it's viewed very differently to having it on Amazon Prime. Yeah. Although YouTube pays very differently to Amazon Prime. Just saying. <laughs> I, I, I imagine peanuts <laughs> is what I hear. It, it depends. Well, but, yeah. that's a whole new okay. um, <laughs> ease off <awesome> debate. <laughs> Okay, um, let, let's, let's bring it back to Jamaica. So obviously you, you filmed it in Montego Bay in Jamaica. Um, now, mm. I, I know obviously in terms of like how these cultures differ vastly, you know, I don't need to ask that question, but I did have an interesting question for you in terms of like, how does Jamaican, um, I suppose, attitudes or the culture in general uh, differ to the US and the UK specifically in terms of vegan cooking? Like what, what is the general kind of uh, ethos out there when it comes to vegan cooking? Vegan cooking has been in existence in Jamaica for a very long time, long before it was trendy in, in Western countries, because oh, okay. there's a minority group in Jamaica called the Rastafarians or Rastas right. yeah. who have the dreadlocks. Now they are vegan. They have a, a whole food plant based diet. They don't have processed food. Um, oh. They're very healthy. A lot of them um, won't even have stuff like tofu because that's processed. So they're, very healthy so jamaicans they may not know it's described the dish as vegan so if you say vegan they might not necessarily know what you mean if you say ital they everybody will know what you mean so rastas eat ital food the minute you say ital food everyone's like oh okay and there's ital restaurants and takeaways so it's actually not difficult with regards to vegan food at all and people don't look down on it Mm. in jamaica or see it as weird they're just like okay so you only have idol food so it's it has a, they have a very different approach be it the name is a bit different um sometimes they'll call it vegetarian but they actually mean vegan um but once you say idol they they do understand yeah, definitely so one could say that that's more kind of where potentially where the origins of veganism originate from then is, is countries like jamaica and possibly africa too by extension no one really knows um because when i did the history of veganism i mean it goes back to roman times and oh no wow. one really okay. knows. i don't think there's yeah that I, I don't think it kind of started in one place and evolved mm. i think it's been in pockets all over the world for a long time so i don't think it's going to be very easy to trace the exact origin because i don't think it came from one place it makes sense really doesn't it because i think i guess we've all many of us are probably very naive in the concept of you know this idea that intolerances didn't exist many ions ago because i mean yeah you can't control how the body is and what it reacts to like i remember just on partially related to this reading a book about um drugs and and how they affect brain chemistry and i remember the thing that stuck out to me the most was how you know every person can take the exact same drug and it'll have a completely different effect so like i remember oh, there was yeah. this really scary story of this person first this this is just in the intro <laughs> it's just like great stuff but the guy was basically like giving a story of how this one person had tried just drinking some alcohol when they were 15 and this person had like a paralyzed effect completely their whole body they couldn't move so obviously they didn't ever drink again but um it's just crazy because for most people you know you get a bit silly and then that's that's it 
you know, and then your body obviously uh, rejects it because it's technically poison and, you know, it goes out and stuff. And it's the same with all, uh, all other drugs. And I suppose with, with food, it's the same. Like I've noticed over the years that uh, certain things, like for instance, I don't know if it's to do with training or uh, just being healthier in general, but my body just rejects like bad food, takeaway food, anything like that. It's like, nope. Okay. <laughs> Please no more. <laughs> um, but I guess it makes sense because the body needs different things at different times, you know, and um, it's, it's just logical that these things have been around since time immemorial. But anyway, going into the weeds, okay. let's bring it back. <laughs> so, yeah, you presented that vegan cooking show in the USA for about four seasons. This is the one where you were just a presenter and, and not being involved yes. production wise. Mm -hmm. uh, during this time, did you notice any kind of major differences between, I suppose, attitudes, approaches to vegan cooking, or just anything else in general, specifically where it pertains to veganism between the UK and the USA? The USA, um, I think they're a little bit ahead when it comes to veganism. Okay. Obviously, it's a big, it's a much, much bigger country so right. there's i mean i don't know if you've been to the u.s i love mm -hmm. going to the supermarkets because the i mean here you'll go down the aisle and you'll have just let's say six different ketchups they'll have 20 different ketchups for example i'll be, I'll be honest so just it, just just to like cut you for one second like I've, I've been to america i've lived in europe and stuff and yeah it's depressing coming back to the uk it's not to say that we don't have good stuff here because we do and we have specialist places and all that but yeah on average, your general supermarket is kind of lacking in, I mean, it's getting better, yeah. but yeah. yeah. <laughs> anyway, sorry, go Yeah, on. so the difference is the choice. Obviously, it's a bigger country, the supermarket. I mean, there isn't anything small in America. Everything's huge. Because I went to a Target in America and then which is when I was filming some of the shows there and they said oh we could go to I think it's called Target Extra or like a super target I just thought what on earth have they got more <laughs> than what they have normally so you know like you can get like um what do they call it? Like you can get though the the Tesco's that right. the, the much bigger. I but do, what they but hold on, does Target sell food as well? I thought they were just a yeah food. Oh wow, okay. I thought they were just yeah. clove re retailer. Wow. No, 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 no. There's Target and Walmart. Yeah, right. I mean, yeah, they have food as well. Yeah. Yeah, I know. I know Walmart sells just. I mean, I've made the joke to many of my American guests that you could you could theoretically live in Walmart in in certain places because this yeah. has got everything. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. yeah, definitely. So yeah, so um, the, the the choice of products. Um, the accessibility to to vegan foods and so forth obviously they've got loads more vegan festivals obviously being a bigger country there's more of what we would have here basically but would you say like so, generally yeah, the were people's attitudes generally people you were talking to people in your sphere uh were they really conscientious about the you know veganism or i guess my, my question is more like you know do you think like the average person cares or is concerned i mean because i remember when i went to california you know it was kind of obvious everyone was very health conscious um but even if you go to other states like there is still this i think the misconception basically that all americans are like really unhealthy and stuff that is a misconception and like if you go into supermarkets you can kind of find everything you can find all the really bad stuff really super unhealthy stuff but you get a lot of healthy stuff as well and and then it, it, to me it kind of it threw me when I went, I was like, well, which is it then? Is, is it like, what, what, what is the average American like? Do they, do they care about health? Do they not? Like, what's the deal? <laughs> it's difficult because it varies so much depending on where you are, because I usually go to New York once a year. New York is actually quite good if you're vegan. Mm. Um, and then you could go to another state and it could be completely different. So it just, it depends where you are and what, what circle you, you're moving in. When I was filming the shows in America, the studio is actually in West Frankfurt, Illinois. Um, okay. So the studio is on 82 acres of land, but a lot of the people who live around there 
are affiliated to the studio and the background of the studio. It's um, not owned by, but the, the people who run it are Seventh-day Adventists. So it's a uh-huh. Seventh-day Adventist television channel. And there's a lot of Seventh-day Adventists who live in and around the studio. So there's a people you're running into when you're filming already are familiar because that particular channel, 3ABN, only has vegan recipes on there. It doesn't have any others. So... I, I didn't... Okay, please go on. Sorry. <laughs> yeah, so it, 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 it really depends where you are because it's, it's just so big and so vast and it's just like very different depending on what you're so to to work out the average american i i, I honestly don't know, <laughs> I, really don't know. <laughs> I, I guess i was just curious because obviously you spent a lot of time there and stuff like maybe you yeah. you'd kind of know the, the pulse i mean from obviously what i've learned so far from what you've said is that like there is this big community out there and and you know it's interesting to hear that they have things like festivals and stuff i mean as it pertains yeah. to the uk i have seen I've, you know, as I said, I know people that are vegan. I've, you know, I've, I've seen obviously vegan products in stores, but it's not like a quite a big thing yet it, in in comparison with maybe how vegetarianism is. Um, although I will say that when it comes to lifestyles, there just seem to be a lot of you know influencers online from the UK as well that are like, hey. You know, this is really important. This can be really good for you. Blah blah blah. I don't know. It's so it's an interesting one. Um, but yeah, uh, one thing I didn't probe you about before, but I feel like it would be good to probe you about is you know clearly there's a very big connection for you with religion and ve- veganism, and as you explained before, that they're pushing it. Um, it. What is the reason behind that? Is is that has it always been that way? Is this a new thing? Um, with with your particular religion that you know no it's always been that way yeah it's it's always been that way we um growing up the the church has always um promoted a plant-based diet not saying you have to so a lot of people they are vegetarian vegan but there's still a lot of people who eat meat and fish but we only eat um what we um feel the bible says are clean i mean i don't eat animals but for the seventh adventist religion there's there's clean and unclean animals for example a a seventh adventist wouldn't have anything from a pig because that's considered an unclean animal they wouldn't have like i mean most people don't wouldn't have like a horse but and they wouldn't have fish that hasn't got scales and things like that so they they eat meat and fish well not me but seventh adventists eat meat and fish but only specific ones so it's a similar ish diet to Judaism in terms of they don't have pork they only eat certain parts of the cow and so forth like that make sure the meat Mm. is of a particular standard and so forth as well yeah you learn something new every day (laughs) um changing it up here what advice would you give to people who are considering going vegan right now I would say start slowly um phase it in so as i was saying earlier start with one meal that you're going to change to be a vegan meal per day um get a keep a a diary and a folder with your favorite recipes that you discover there are certain things that you gonna have to find a new love because uh there was somebody who i was doing a seminar she says i just i'm going vegan but i just can't find then there wasn't as many options as there are now she said i just love omelets i just want to find (laughs) a way to make omelets without eggs and at the time i said i would focus on finding a new love because you can make an omelet without egg but it's not going to taste exactly like it because it's not it so the you know, finding new loves as well. But in addition to that, I would say, be careful who you share with because some people will not be helpful. Because if you say, oh, I'm, I'm starting to go vegan, some people will go, oh, what do you want to bother with that for? Or they'll question you, why are you doing it? And they, sometimes people project their issues onto you because they feel they should. And they say, and they start to kind of 
be argumentative about it. People will ask questions. Yeah, I know it's ridiculous. Just People will it. ask questions. <laughs> so, yeah. So c come ready with your, your answers to kind of almost rehearse it, so to speak. So what I did when I first became a vegan is when people asked me why you're a vegan, because I realized it started to become a heated debate. I used to shy away and not say, and then I thought, well, that doesn't work either. So what I used to say is I'm a vegan because I've chosen to be a vegan. I'm a happy vegan. I'm not an angry vegan. I prefer to eliminate meat, fish, eggs, dairy, and honey. And that's my choice. But if other people don't have that choice, that's not a problem for me. So then that kind of quashes the debate because they kind of presuppose you're an angry vegan and a judgmental vegan. So, yeah. So that have those, all those things in mind. Awesome. And be Thank creative. You. Cook vegan versions of the dishes you like. Find new loves. If you can't cook, learn to cook. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> Thanks for sharing. I appreciate that. Um, I've often heard that going uh, completely vegan can be kind of expensive. So is this actually <laughs> true or is it possible to do it for less maybe? Like what's, what's the deal with that? It isn't because if you think, if you're going to buy meat or fish, cons consider the price of meat and fish to mm. vegetables, beans, pulses. There is a misconception that veganism is more expensive. And I think the reason for that is certain vegan products are more expensive because they're not as mass produced or subsidized by the government as other non-vegan items. So it's a misconception. And also if you're going to have a whole food plant-based diet, we're not just chucking junk down your throat 24 seven, <laughs> it is a lot cheaper. So for example, I make, butter bean and lentil curry butter beans are really cheap a tin is like about 30 pence mm. lentils red lentils are really cheap and to make that as a dish is dirt cheap <laughs> yes and you can have that with some rice or i like steamed buckwheat and i like plantain so you can have a side of plant that dish is not going to be expensive at all so and it's also a good way to use up leftovers if you want to make sweet potato roti and things like that. So, yeah. yeah I always... didn't realise a lot of these things that I just eat in general are actually vegan. <laughs> just... yeah. So when people, yeah. So when people say to me, oh, I never eat vegan food, I say, um, do you eat fruit? Yes, it's vegan. Do you drink water? Yeah, that's vegan. Okay. We're on a roll here. So, do you, and, I, and I say, do you have beans? Yeah. Yeah. Okay. So... People don't really, I said to them, I usually say to people, if you look at your meal, there's only certain parts of it that are not vegan. The whole thing is not non-vegan. Because if you have a side order of, of vegetables, because I, it, you know, like a typical Sunday roast, it's only the roast and maybe the Yorkshire puds that mm -hmm. are not vegan. Everything else is. So it just depends. The gravy can be, and it can be easily converted to a vegan dish so yeah. yeah i think with a lot of those things as well you can't taste the difference like i've had like i don't know if it's vegan gravy but i've, I've definitely had vegetarian gravy and it's like there's just no difference in taste i mean maybe yeah, a yeah. little bit of it's i don't know i suppose it depends how fussy you are like i remember trying corn mints uh i, I know this isn't vegan but like um for vegetarians i remember trying i think it was a corn mince like spaghetti bolognese or something I just couldn't tell the difference. I was like, maybe at least a little bit more seasoning than in the standard bolognese, but yeah. same, same stuff. <laughs> there you go. <laughs> um, would you say it's easier or more difficult to be vegan in the USA compared to the UK? I feel this is an obvious question, but just in terms of accessibility. I would say it's probably today, it's probably the same. Okay. Because so many companies have jumped on the bandwagon with making vegan, vegan products. There's so much more information in the UK. Um, there's a lot of vegan festivals. I was due to appear at about six vegan festivals this year. Oh, wow. Actually, I, I only did one online, but there you go. So there's, there's a lot more. There's a lot more um, information and um, choices in the UK. So I would say it's probably more or less the same as the USA in proportion, but obviously in the USA, it's a bigger country. There's more 
companies and so forth. But in general, I'd say if you're a vegan living in the UK or a vegan living in the USA, I think it's roughly the same experience, roughly. Yeah. And in those, I wouldn't say more difficult. And, and in the US and, and the UK, where do you think are like the best places to get, uh, to source vegan products in general? Like where's, where would you go? Trader Joe's, Trader Joe's, Whole Foods, um, Kruger's, Walmart, um, and um, Target as well has some options. Uh, yeah, mainly those. I would but say, particularly Trader Joe's. How about for the for the UK? Where, where, where would for the UK? Everywhere, most major <laughs> supermarkets have vegan options. Whole Foods is great. A lot of, of the independent um, Whole Foods stores, like um, in North London, there's one called Mama Earth or Mother Earth. There's um, um that's an independent um, Whole Foods shop there's yeah every yeah everywhere most major supermarkets because if you're doing your shopping online if you can get a slot and if you put vegan into the search (laughs) if you put vegan into the search it usually brings up most of the products that are identified or specified that they're vegan um obviously it's not going to bring up grapes because they i think sainsbury's realized that most people can figure that out that it's vegan but you know what i mean you'd be, you'd be surprised yeah, so i've seen that label on some surprising things <laughs> they're just doing it for marketing because there's certain products like shreddies it put started to put vegan on it and i thought well i don't think anyone thought it wasn't well, okay my that favorite is when you. it's like gluten free on something that would just never have gluten in, like I don't know. I know it's just, <laughs> just trying to look in the know and in the trend, basically. So yeah, so in terms of that, and and obviously depending on where you live, where they have pounder bowl, fruit and veg. I mean that's all vegan um, everywhere, and Amazon delivers a lot of stuff, um, and yeah. There's also um, lots of, if you go onto Instagram, there's lots of vegan um, food um, companies that advertise on there as well. So yeah, yeah, it's, there's, there's a lot. It's, it's, quite, it's quite easy, I would say. Awesome, awesome. Uh, let's switch it up again. What are your main kind of aspirations with your current business ventures? Now I use business ventures as a blanket term because you do a lot of different things like i said in the beginning you know with youtube cooking shows your books also uh we haven't got onto this just yet but your keynote talks as well so um yeah what were your biggest goals as of right now for just in general all of those things well the global pandemic has kind of changed that a tad if you could probably um imagine because i was on a book tour Ah. uh, for my book called cooking with kids but that kind of halted came to an almighty halt I was how, to how to... far into that were you before before it got cut well the book was published in november okay. and then obviously march came the lockdown so got a few months in well, what came you... <laughs> yeah there was a lot that was done there was a lot that was done in that time but yeah so i was supposed to go to south africa and america to film stuff based on the book and so that didn't happen um so now my goals really are to do more with my social media there is an opportunity to film season two of my amazon series um it will have to be done differently because Mm. i will be going nowhere because most air (laughs) corridors are shut (laughs) so it will be probably something with zoom involved or something so that that's been worked on but i've just been offered a radio show that um goes into production nice. to next week where i'll be starting to record um the shows so actually two radio shows so for that particular radio station so i'll be doing working on that so i want to grow my social media even more I'm working with different brands that reach out to me quite a lot. I had uh, brands that reach out to me and say, could you try one of our products and could you tell us what you think and could you make a recipe with it? And they usually pay a fee for that. Um, 
uh, or sometimes they say, could you run a competition? So they win one of our prizes to get some publicity. So I want to grow my social media even more. And I'm doing some online classes, um, low, low, low cost, um, tasty, low cost vegan meals and vegan baking classes online as well. So yeah, I'm doing quite a lot, I guess. <laughs> Yeah, I, I got to ask you real quick about this because um, th- I was going to ask you something different. But um, since we're talking about all the different things you do, you're also working as a full time internal communications consultant. I stalked your LinkedIn for this one. Um, OK. And also, you know, obviously, as a, as a public speaker with the keynotes things. And I'm just looking at everything. I'm sitting back and I'm like, how does this lady find the time to do all of these different things like it blows my I mind <laughs> don't work. yeah i don't do the internal comms anymore oh I okay don't. no i don't do that anymore um but i do get lots of speaking engagements mm. so yeah i do do that in terms of fitting stuff in you'd be amazed what you can fit in really so are you maybe, are you a parent as well kids. You haven't got any, no. ah, okay. So that's no, one thing no. that makes it a little bit easier then. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Not even a goldfish. So yeah, that obviously would make a big difference. But I've, I've seen other people who do more than me and they have got kids. So I think, well, no excuse really. Yeah, I mean- when I, I was at university, yeah. So when I was at university, for example, there was a lady in my class who was a mature student. She had three kids- all under 10, one was a baby and they were all in primary school and she excelled because she basically said, I have to push harder than everyone else because I've got more on my plate. I just thought there's me lamenting about being in university and oh, it's so hard. I thought, you know what, be quiet because you do not have three kids. So yeah, there's a lot you can get done. This is, this is what I always think as well. When people say, Oh, I just don't have the time. It's like, yeah, because I've worked with people that are like that. I, m- I remember working with a lady who uh, many years ago when I used to work in a supermarket and um, she was working full time and she had a teenage daughter and she was doing like night courses to study, to do, I can't remember what the field she was going in. I think teaching. I think she was trained to be a teacher. Um, and I was just blown away by how she was able to find the time to do all of that. But it, it is about willpower. It is about, you know, saying, okay, I'm going to dedicate this time to do this and i'm just gonna make it happen i'm just gonna do it (laughs) nothing's gonna stop me i think that's the the way the way you got to approach these things but uh in in all seriousness though like it's it is fascinating looking at all these different things that you do and another question that comes to mind for me when i was looking at all those things is like do you have a team of people uh, sort of producing you know everything on on your social medias and managing all of that or is it just you because you're very very no wow no, it's me damn because like, you're very active that's the thing you're doing so much and i know as well because obviously when i started this podcast i did not realize how much work would have to go into it <laughs> in terms of like editing (laughs) social media you name it and you know it's the same as what i said before you you just do it right but it does take a hell of a lot of time and the whole time i'm thinking like in the future i'm gonna get a team i'm not gonna do all of this stuff but for right now without the resources i gotta do it um but that yeah that's that's pretty amazing to me um that you're able to pull that off like do you have like a, a strategy for that or do you just like, how do you how do you manage all that for my social media yeah just, just yeah just, not just your social media but also just managing all of these projects and and making sure that you kind of are able to do them yeah. all simultaneously yeah I, I i have like a strategy and a, and each week um i have um siblings so myself and my older sister is on social media as well um hers um she's married so her surname is different to mine is williams so it's audrey williams flowers to interiors so we have a meeting every sunday to say right look at what she's doing and if i can offer any 
constructive criticism and she'll look at what I'm doing and offer some extra constructive criticism as well. And then I met up with a friend of mine called Chantelle yesterday who she's on social media. She's called the budget mom. She budget mom UK. She's on social media. So I, the same I said to her why don't we do like weekly check-in sessions to say right how are you doing how are things going so when you have that that does help you to kind of push ahead even more and then I kind of plan out my day so I'll have a list of what I'm doing today and I'll think right I need to get this done so I'll make sure for one hour I sit and I focus on this so I've got my kind of list for today of what I've been doing so I've got down on it um, podcast interview with Christian Reeves <laughs> so I've got all my time because I like to at the end of the day and the week to be able to say right I achieved this 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 and this in the day because sometimes people <laughs> say they haven't got yeah I love ticking things off on the list because sometimes people say I haven't got the time but if you kind of sat and did a um, log of what you did throughout the day you probably think actually I spent four hours watching a box set on Netflix you could have spent one hour watching the box set and three hours or even two hours watching the box set and achieved other things or multitask, watch the box set and get stuff done at the same time. So it's a question of how you prioritize your time, I think. I couldn't agree more with you. Yeah, I'm exactly the same with that. And I think it applies to other things as well, like uh, money. When people say, oh, you know, I just don't have the money for this. And while it might be true, you know, we all do struggle. I know I, I do. But when you look at like your expenses and, and what you're spending your money on in general, um, yeah, a lot of the time you can afford things. You just are spending your money unnecessarily on certain things. And I feel like time and money are very similar in, in that respect, you know, and um it's just yeah it's, i think what, what you proposed just then that's how i do it as well it's always best to kind of look at the short-term goals you can achieve to get to the the bigger goals and stuff and it's less daunting that way as well and i feel like it's more it's more motivational like no one likes to have like loads and loads and loads of work uh piled on top of them i mean i don't know i suppose it depends what you're doing for me when it's this stuff i love it even though I know the work that's involved, I love to do it. So it's different, but I, I will say in general that having that approach does lighten the load and make it a bit easier by comparison. Mm -hmm. But uh, Definitely. Yeah. awesome. Awesome. Uh, switching it up again. So as you mentioned before, you've written vegan cookbooks for both adults and children more recently for children. Um, yes. Did you, I mean, I feel like this is kind of an obvious question. I've asked a, a previous uh, guest of mine the same question because he wrote uh, comedy books for children. Um, did you approach them differently? And if so, what were the kind of major differences? Because obviously writing for children and writing for adults are naturally going to be different anyway. But um, what were the key differences in terms of how you approach those two books, uh, different types of books? So... For the kids' book, um, I got a deal with the publishers for that. So I didn't set out to do a kids' book. Oh. But what I discovered is when um, the publishers approached me that they had been following me on social media and looking at what I was doing, and then they um, contacted me and said, we would like to bring you in for a meeting with regards a cookbook. So mm. I thought, oh, great. So I went, came all prepared with all my ideas of what I want to do. And opportunities don't always work out exactly as you would want them to. So I basically went into the meeting and was like, oh, yeah, I was like, I can do this, blah, 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 blah. And they were like, oh, yeah, yeah, that's really good. But we would like to pitch an idea to you. Have you thought, I thought, okay, didn't see that coming. Said, we were thinking of a kid's book. What do you think? And I thought, okay not going to turn down an opportunity just because it's not packaged exactly as I want it. So yeah, so they had quite a, um, an idea of how, what would be included in the book um, and how it would, kind. Of, they showed me a mock-up of the book. They said, this is kind of what we were thinking and so forth. So yeah, it was, it was a really, they had a lot of input because when you have a publishing deal, I didn't realize how much input the publisher has people think you just send them the stuff and they publish it and you get money and that's it no it is a whole process so yeah um the the process was different because that for that my latest book i'm working with a publisher so yeah that makes a big difference in, in terms of like how you actually wrote them and, and stuff like was that 
process similar or different or did you kind of approach it just in the same way but maybe different language you it's pr- approach similarly but what i have to bear in mind is what would a child eat so what um i don't have any kids but i have two nieces and a nephew they're 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 older now but when they were smaller i noticed that my my um my sister and her husband really good um at making sure they have a quite a well-rounded palate but i noticed when their friends came to dinner sometimes the friends were a bit more picky so my sister would cook like really great spread but then she'll always do like a pasta dish because she says if they eat nothing else, they will have, you know, pasta with a sauce on it. So you just have to think of different palates, what's easy to eat, what little fingers can pick up and what will go in a lunch box and things like that. What will interest them that's healthy and exciting as well. So I do a peanut butter and banana flapjack, for example, as well. So that's you can cut that up into squares. That makes it easier. I do a trail mix, which is like a mixture of... Um, nuts and those are um, addictive <laughs> yeah seeds um raisins and so forth so you know just things like that that they will like yeah were there so any... it's a slightly different approach yeah sorry okay okay and were there any kind of like uh, challenges with with regards to that pro- i mean presumably there are some but like anything maybe that kind of caught you off guard or i don't know maybe something that just made it a bit tricky or something like that like anything like that with regards to the whole writing a book. Yeah, um, yeah. So, so it could be for, for the adult ones or the children's ones in general. Just, yeah, like what are the challenges of uh, writing, writing these, these cookbooks? I would do it differently for my next cookbook because what I would do is from the, the minute the publisher that you sign the contract that in the contract it gives you the date when you have to give them the first draft mm. what i would do is delay that yeah i would say <laughs> right i would say right i will like to sign the contract but have a different run-up or what i would do what i've done now is for my next book i've already got recipes that i'm going to put into mm. it so what is good to do test and create your recipes in advance so when the publisher says we'd like to bring a book um like you to do a book you're actually not writing anything because you've got it all already so yeah so you've got it good to go so to have to be more prepared for when the publisher approaches you so then all all it is really is about layout and photography basically and the marketing and, and so forth in in general when when you get these books like how long do they give you to to write the book like what's what's the leeway i signed they gave me four months to get the first draft but i had been in negotiations with them prior to signing the contract Right. So what, the, what you do is when you have the meeting with them, they say, um, okay, give us a list of what would be in the contents for the book. So they said, we want it to be a kid's book, blah, blah, blah. Give us a list of what would be in the contents. So I had no idea how many recipes needed to be in it. So I had a list of 160 recipes and they were like, okay, that's actually two books. So edit out half of them. And let's go with that. So I already knew which recipes were going to go into the book. So then now I have to make sure. And then for each recipe, they wanted a little bit of blurb before, you know, to go with each recipe and so forth. And then I did that. And then they said, okay, so now we need more. I'm like, like what? More recipes? No. So they wanted, as you look at the beginning of the book, it's like more um, information like, um, replacing eggs setting up your vegan kitchen um conversion tables for um ovens and weights and measurements and so forth so all of that information they wanted in the beginning so first of all i sent them a couple of pages and they went no 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 we need we need more we need more so then i thought oh, okay let's knock this out of the park so i sent them 14 pages and they were like oh wow yeah yeah because i thought well you can cut <laughs> 
but you can't stretch. So, right. They were like, yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, that's brilliant. That's really. And then the book blurb, I said, right, this is my draft book blurb for the inside and at the back. I mean, they wrote their own, but if you give them enough to work with, then they're fine. And then they said, oh, we need pictures of you. No problem. Yeah, I have a theatrical background. I've got pictures of myself. Then most people have got hot dinners. So yeah, I sent them all of that. So that was great. And then some of the recipes they weren't familiar with. So I said, right, this is what it should look like. And then they um, got the pictures to, to go in the book. Yeah. So that's kind of the process. Just um, while you've been talking about that, I think this goes back to, to what we were talking about before about you managing everything. So well, like, where did you learn to kind of market yourself in the way that you do? Cause I feel that like this isn't something that's very easy to learn. Like I learned kind of through my business studies, through my degree, through many other things, but I, I feel that like even with studies, it's not necessarily something you can easily learn. Like you kind of have to know that, that at all times, you know, everything you do is a, is a reflection of you. Like for example, uh, how responsive you are with messaging as an example you know so, some of the guests I've had maybe not as quick to respond you know that's fine everyone is different it's different walks of life but like to me it made sense it's like this is this woman is businesswoman she knows what she's doing she knows why this stuff is is important um you talked to us a little bit about that like did did you learn about this somewhere or is this just something that you're just naturally good at like what's What's the deal with that? In terms of the marketing, my degree is in media and cultural studies, and I do have a background in PR agency. Ah, and okay. um, I did work in internal communications. But in addition to that, what I would say is my country of origin is Jamaica. And if you think Jamaica is a tiny island of 3.5 million people, yet it's incredibly famous around the world. And I thought, why is that? Um, because you think there's loads of singers that come out of there that are hugely famous. And I thought, how have we managed to be, I mean, you, I've never met anyone who said, oh, I've never heard of Jamaica. Where's that? <laughs> That's true. They've heard of it. <laughs> yeah. No one says, oh, where's that? Because I've, I, I've got friends from other, whose country of origin are other Caribbean countries. And they said they're forever trying to tell people where it is and, you know, where, and they're like, oh, right, where's that? So what I looked at is why is Jamaica so incredibly famous and for a number of reasons obviously all of the I mean like Bob Marley's from there and you know there's lots of famous singers from there but I thought but what have they done to push the whole Jamaica thing and what I've noticed is naturally Jamaicans we're good at promoting ourselves so it's a cultural thing so if you notice almost every single Jamaican produced production has the Jamaican flag in it, whether it makes any creative sense or not. This is so true. Yeah. I was, uh, while you were talking, I was just thinking of that pitch in Dragon's Den all those years ago. I think it was the reggae reggae Levi sauce Roots. one. Levi, Levi Roots, Roots, that's it. Yeah. yeah and <laughs> yeah. I mean, if I remember correctly, yeah, the Jamaican flag is on the bottles. That's like the first thing near the logo is, is the Jamaican flag. Yeah. 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 It makes sense. So a lot of people can identify the Jamaican flag simply because it's, it's promoted left, right and centre. Because I've seen some videos where it's got the Jamaican flag in it. And I thought, okay, so... But then you, it also lets you know it has a Jamaican connection as well. Because I think it was Liberty X, um, that pop group. Um, they filmed one of their music videos in Jamaica it wasn't obvious because of the shots what country it was you knew it was a tropical country but right at the end there's a jamaican flag and i thought ah oh, they filmed it in jamaica so there you go so that's kind of so being from a jamaican background and also studying it and also i have a, a theatrical background and you are taught to promote yourself if mm. you want to get a job yeah particularly now i mean the industry's changed with social media and so forth yep. But you have to know, I mean, you're taught when I was at school, you have to be in spotlight, you have to have your CV, you have to have your photos, you have to go on auditions, you have to get people know who you are, what you do, so forth, you have a show reel. Yeah. It's, it's true. It's funny how all, all of these uh, industries are very the same. I mean, 
acting for me for example is something i got into last year but it's a very similar process you know yeah yeah you have to have all of these things you know like Mm -hmm. i still don't have them because i'm very novice at this point but like you know your showreel and and uh your headshots and all this and to me it's like just standard marketing stuff no it's like on my website i mean there's always stuff that i'm adding on there but it's like that's like your hub and if you don't have something it's like well why don't you have that <laughs> you should have that <laughs> so like when i when i see like for instance with your brand i see that you're everywhere and it's like yeah of course like this is it's maximum reach and um in particular like the way especially with with you know cooking and stuff the way things are approached is is very key you know like how you approach say twitter is different from instagram and obviously that's for a reason it's what has the best reach on that platform and you know as we all know like food does very well on instagram (laughs) it's it's just one of those things but yeah um speaking of websites though uh your website uh, actually has this option which i thought was pretty cool I, i i it makes sense as well but it's possible to book your catering services and uh this to me was was quite cool because i thought well who are some of the biggest clients that you've actually catered for and um with those experiences well, what did they teach you i don't actually do outside catering but people book me for various things so they book me for like um public speaking or presenting ah, or okay. for okay. social media gigs and different things like that i've done a lot of um now zoom um online presenting different things so yeah people people usually i find that i get books a bit more through instagram um not through my website as such um or they will get in touch um, because they've seen me because i've done a since my book was launched in november i've done probably about 40 media interviews radio tv newspaper Damn. magazine podcasts so i just basically didn't come up for air i just thought right there's no point having a book and no one knows it's there so i've been really pushing with that yeah with promoting it so yeah fair play fair play and, and what yeah, let's talk about it um you're a seasoned professional public speaker keynote speaker what advice would you give to people about how to do it successfully with public speaking the main thing is to when you get a booking or even if you do a booking for free to start off with record it make sure you've got a good video and if you can have two cameras if you can um so you can get a couple of different shots so it's not just one still camera in the same position if you can if not if it's one camera in the same position that's fine so it's always good to have footage of you speaking because people can know from the footage if they want to book you um also or if you if you want to be a speaker on your linkedin profile the cover page as you saw on my speaker one is very obvious that i um, do speaking gigs from that cover page and also look at so there's agencies you can join some are good and some are less good i guess so you can go to agencies but you can also approach different event planners and so forth as well and um once you have a reputation for speaking it will start to snowball a bit because i've done a few speaking gigs recently and it's usually people who have seen me in something else and they approached me and said, could you do a speaking gig? Right. Yeah. I was going to ask you about that as well. How did you actually get into public speaking? Was, was that something, as you just said, that, you know, just happened because, you know, people saw you on the TV, saw that you've, you know, you're capable of doing speaking and stuff and thought, okay, she'd be good for this. Or was it something that you were already targeting and had in your kind of sights anyway? I've always done um, speaking gigs because when you're a Seventh-day Adventist and you grow up in the church, a lot of people who are Seventh-day Adventists are good at public speaking because from a young age, from the minute you can talk, they will have you up in front of the church to do a presentation or to recite something from the Bible or to sing a song. So public speaking for a Seventh-day Adventist is actually not, a huge problem because we're used to it from a young age and obviously I, i'm a seventh adventist and i have a theatrical background so it's not 
So I have a double whammy, so to speak. Just born to do this. So I've, <laughs> yeah. So I've a lot of speaking gigs, so to speak, in the church mm-hmm. arena. And then I did an interview some years ago for a particular radio station. The person who was the presenter was um, putting on an event and she approached me and said, would you speak at this event? (coughs) So, yeah. So that's kind of how I kind of got started. So when when the opportunities came, then I started to film some of them as well. Yeah. I think, I think that's as well, just on a side note, that that's kind of how it works with life. For, the, for those who are interested in, in getting in these, these fields, I think with someone like yourself, you know, you're very open, you're very positive. So people are drawn to that anyway. But also, yeah, if, if you make yourself readily available and you say, hey, I'm up for anything kind of thing, then people do approach you for things. You know, I, I've been approached for things that I never anticipated being approached for because I've done other things. Like I've done like voice acting, for example. And that just came yeah. from people seeing my videos and being like, yeah, would you do this thing? And I think like that, that's the thing. You just got to make yourself open and, and try different things. And then the more you do that, the bigger the portfolio or whatever you're trying to build happens. And then you get all these different other opportunities. And um, for you, it's, it's mm-hmm. like built you this whole other kind of career, if you like, like, obviously, it's connected with everything you do. And that's an important thing, too, is, is trying to have like a, a way of connecting all those things together. But um, still, you know, it's like, I, I do the same thing. I'm always looking for different ways to work, I guess, is probably the best way to put it. <laughs> so yeah, it's fascinating stuff. Yeah, it's, it's having a, as many strings to your bow because at um i went to a stage school they said it's about being a triple threat and they say you know singing acting dancing but nowadays it's not just singing acting dancing it's presenting it's social media influencer public speak you know there's there's yeah. more strings you can add to your bow than just those three because some people are good at acting but they may not be good at singing and dancing. So you could be acting, you could be a presenter, you could be an author. There's lots of other stuff that you can do as well. And um, just uh, another thing as well that you do, um, the many different things that you do, (laughs) you're a very active uh, food columnist. How did you get involved with that? How did that start? So the first food column I had, I had a publicist at the time and she was the former editor of a glossy woman's magazine called Pride, which is targets um, uh, Afro-Caribbean women in the UK mainly. So she got me the gig to do the column in that magazine. And then I, as a result of that, I was able to step into another column I had into in the Islington Gazette where I um, had a column there for a year. So, yeah, and I would be really happy to have another one. <laughs> so, yeah, so that, that was really good. So, yeah, having a publicist helps a ton. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Does it differ much Definitely. in terms of the, the approach in comparison with, say, like how you write your blog? For those who don't know, uh, Curly Sue has a blog on her web website which is something that you update here and there with various recipes and and just also some interesting stuff about about yourself as well which is what i used as source material as well um and um i just wondered a little bit but like is there a difference in in how you approach those different forms of writing because i know in my personal life i do approach writing for different things in a different way (laughs) yeah for the um column it's kind of personal but it's not okay it has to be a little bit more formal but with my blog you basically write whatever you want whatever style you want however you want because i just wrote one um five um tasty low cost um vegan meals i just did um, a blog about that i've got a um uh vegan and sustainability christmas gift guide guide that's coming out on my blog soon as well so yeah it's yeah there is a different approach not hugely because you are yourself and you 
bring your particular style. But when it's for a particular publication, you have to bear in mind their audience. So you have to tailor make it a little bit for that particular audience. So with the glossy women's magazine, I knew it's mainly women, obviously. And for the newspaper, it's more of a community kind of thing because it was Islington Gazette. So, yeah. Uh, there just was find- Islington Gazette and the Hampstead and Highgate Gazette as well. Yeah. Awesome. 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 Uh, here's, here's just a fun question. Uh, what's your favorite recipe that you've created and why? My favorite one that I've created is called planting cups with Aki filling. So planting is kind of like a banana looking. Oh thing. yeah. I know those. Yeah. Some people call it plantains, but just as a little Planting. Thing. I say so then. Planting. It's planting. It's a bit like saying Great Britain. It's, <laughs> it's Great Britain. Yeah, it just doesn't make any sense. So it's planting. Um, so you you boil the plantain and then you drain it and um, blot it dry and then you mold it into a cup and you put it in a bun tin, lit like the cupcake tin, and you bake it. And then you cook ackee. Ackee is actually a fruit, but it's eaten like a vegetable. And um, it's kind of like a yellow in color. And you cook that with um, tomatoes, onions, um, bell peppers, and so forth, and different seasonings. And then you pile that into the um, planting cup. So yeah, that's one of my favorites that I've created. My other one, I didn't create it, but one of my favorites is um baking vegan sponge cake my best performing youtube video which has over a quarter of a million views is how to make a vegan sponge cake and if um you asked me which video would be your best performing i honestly didn't know it would be as simple as that it's never it's never the one you expect it's never (laughs) no not at all and it wasn't even the one i was most proud of i'm like okay wow this what is it with that like there's this vlog that i did uh a couple of months back and it's only because it's a trending topic i think that's why but you know i just randomly did it with no thought or anything i just put it out and then it got like close to two thousand views and i was like why (laughs) it's just i didn't even do anything but everything else I'm putting so much effort in and it's, it's not quite, no. <laughs> yeah. It's weird. Cause I did one, how to peel ginger with a spoon and that got thousands of views, how to make, how to cook buckwheat. Mm. And that got thousands of views. So I just thought maybe I was thinking too complicated. Maybe I just need to keep it really simple to get, you know, views well, so I- with tons of views. Yeah, I suppose with YouTube as well, like many people, I know I do as well, you, you use it as a, as a place to find tutorials, to find ways to do things because mm-hmm. it's like, mm-hmm. why, why not? You know, if you don't know, just go online, go on YouTube and there's probably someone explaining exactly how to do that. And it's like, brilliant. <laughs> and the simpler the better. Yeah, definitely. Yeah. Because people come to YouTube for two, two main things, information and entertainment. So, yeah. yeah. Absolutely. Absolutely. Uh, Drawing everything to a close today, do you have any kind of upcoming projects or perhaps some final thoughts that you'd like to share with us? Well, there's my radio show that's coming out soon, um, which is called Curly Sue's Plant-Based Kitchen. So I've been just working with, uh, I put out on social media, you know, is anyone interested in being a guest on my show? And it was like, wow a whole surge of different people had the different pr agencies approach me say yes my client would be perfect for this i'm like oh, wow. Oh, wow. Okay. okay yeah so that that was inter- that's been interesting um season two of the amazon show i'm working on that one um i'm also doing my um, christmas gift guide so i'm just looking for specific gifts um that will be appropriate to go into it as well and i'm also doing the online classes um the ones for vegan cooking and what vegan cooking on a budget and vegan baking as well so yeah so i've got quite a lot on i i didn't expect anything less yeah (laughs) but i can (laughs) i can i can i can i can um I can relate. I, it's, I think it's always good to be busy and to have things on the go. Yeah. And it's, I think that, you know, especially with everything that's going on right now, it is better to be busy than to 
you know be bogged down with loads of time and not knowing what to do with it so yeah it's good yeah. and um you know your stuff is doing really well and um yeah, it's thank you. It's, it's fantastic to see, and um, just what I just want to say a big thank you for for appearing on the show. It's been a real pleasure, and um, I wish you all the best in the future with with your endeavors. And uh, hopefully, yeah, we'll see more of of your uh, TV show in the future. And I hope the radio show does well. I'm sure it will. <laughs> yeah. Well, thank you for having me. It's been enjoyable. Thank you. No problem. And uh, I want to say a big thank you to all of my listeners of the Christian Reef podcast, wherever you listen to the podcast. Let me know, by the way, it'd be fun to know actually where you're listening or if you're watching the YouTube videos. Um, I always like to know. Let me know about future topics, future guests you'd like to see on the podcast. Get in touch with me. I'm available everywhere and I would love to have you on the show or, you know, I'd love to speak about the topic that you're interested in hearing about, whatever it may be. I'd love to know. So thank you very much. And until next time, peace out, one love. I'll see you in the next one. Bye.